We are going to start with GI, hepatic, and electrolytes. That means we are covering GI system and hepatic. What is in hepatic is liver, gallbladder, and pancreas. Electrolytes are very important to know along with GI, so I gave you the package, and you guys have the packages on electrolytes and GI. So we will start with the package here. I gave you with GI system, and what the first thing I'm going to go over is some of the diagnostic tests, and that's on the first page. What are the diagnostic tests we have is upper GI and lower GI. We got to pay attention to know the wording. So when they're saying patient is going for upper GI, that means patient is going for barium swallow. Make sure we highlight the word barium swallow. And when they give ask the question for upper GI, that means patient is also going for x-ray. So remember the word x-ray. Remember the word barium swallow. Because that's important to know patient is going to be taking barium. So two word is important, and it's called, what do you do before patient is going for upper GI and VO? Number two, post-op. What do you do after post-op? Is laxative, it is to give, why? Because barium causes constipation. And what is the barium looks like? It's more chalk color. So patient is going to say, I'm passing the BM, and it's a white color, like a chalk color, that means patient is having a white stool. And next is the bowel obstruction. We need to monitor for bowel obstruction. And what would you give to prevent bowel obstruction? The fluids. So let me repeat here. Upper GI, patient is going for barium swallow. They're going to do x-ray. And remember, when you're doing for x-ray, what do you remove? All the metals. Maybe your answer is to remove metal. And what do you monitor after upper GI is constipation. What do you encourage patient here? The fluid. Next is lower GI. When patient is going for lower GI, it's called barium anima. And what would you do here is patient is getting is barium rectally and post-op care is you monitor same as you did, but pre-op a little bit different here. What do you do in pre-op care is low residual diet. What diet do we give? Low residual. So lower GI means they are inserting a barium, but what do you need to have your patient need to be clear? And so what do you give before patient is going? Let's see in pre-op care. What do you do in pre-op care? Low residual diet. Maybe that one we need to prepare. Second thing is, you give liquid diet. Very important, the third one, is anima. Maybe they will say, what do you do? Your patient is going for lower GI. Give them anima. Make sure they are clear. After patient come back, again, because it's barium, what do we monitor is constipation. So go on post-op care. What do you give them is fluid. Monitor for is no BM. If patient has no BM for two days, then you need to notify. But to prevent that, give fluids and monitor patient for constipation. Everyone is okay, upper GI and lower GI. What are we using here is barium and barium constipate the patient. So that's important. In upper GI, we are doing the x-ray. I will move on. Next one, gastric analysis. What is in gastric analysis word is? That means they are, what is gastric means? A stomach. And what our analysis means, they're going to remove the fluid from the stomach. As we read, gastric analysis means aspirating gastric content. So what do we know? How do you aspirate them? Right down on the top is inserting NG2. What are we inserting here? NG2. So when you insert NG2, what are we doing here? 
aspirating the stomach content. So gastric analysis, as you see the word, what are we doing here? Removing the stomach fluid. And what are we putting here? NG2. Pre-op care, what do we do pre-op care? Number one, NPO. Before patient is NPO, what do we do? No tobacco, no chewing gum. And very important, the next line is no stimulant. That means any medication patient is taking with stimulant, what do we do? We hold it. And why? You want to get the fluid normal, not by stimulating the stomach. And what are we checking here is the gastric acidity, pH. What are we checking here? pH of the stomach. So that's, you can highlight that, pH of the stomach. But post-op care, these labs should be, we should send the specimen to the lab immediately. And if you're not sending immediately, what do we do? Refrigerate. So every time you're aspirating, and when do we aspirate, then you put the fluid in the tubing and put them in the fridge. So remember, we said, what are we aspirating here? Gastric content. And what do we do? We need to put that NG tube. We aspirate the stomach content. And how frequently you are aspirating, which is in gastric analysis, the first line, every 15 minutes for one hour. So gastric analysis, we are aspirating stomach fluid every 15 minutes for one hour, and you keep them in the fridge if you're not sending it to the lab immediately. And what are we checking here is the pH of the stomach. That's the gastric analysis. So, so far, we talked about in GI, upper GI, lower GI, and gastric analysis. Everyone is okay? Upper GI, lower GI, gastric analysis. Now, I will move on. On the same page is EGD. What is EGD is endoscopy. So when we are getting questioned, or we are asked, or your patient is scheduled, and they are saying patient is going for endoscopy, endoscopy means is also is EGD, endoscopy. And in endoscopy, patient is going, there are two tests I will be talking about, EGD. What is EGD is, it says esophago gastro didnoscopy. So what are we looking here in endoscopy? E means esophagus. G means gastric. D means duodenum. So upper GI means EGD. So if they're saying patient is going for upper GI endoscopy means is what are we looking here is the esophagus, stomach, and endoscopy means is they're looking through from here, your GI system. And where do we start the GI system from? Esophagus and stomach, and we are going into duodenum. Underline the word is sedated. Sedation is given when patient is going for endoscopy. Pre-op care, very important. As we see the word endoscopy, we are going from through the mouth, and patient is pre-op, NPO. We must keep our patient NPO to prevent vomiting and aspiration. So NPO for how long? For 12 hours. So patient is NPO for 12 hours. And second line, if you move on, our, we, we are saying is sedation. Why do we give sedation to relax the patient? And what do we give the patient here? is underlying the word Versed. Versed is the medication. We must remember a lot of drugs as we move on. So Versed is asked, and what do we use Versed? For relaxing the patient. How do we give them Versed, maybe IV? And also, what do you monitor when you're giving Versed? I want you to write down there, when you're giving worsed, what are you monitoring? Respiration. It depresses respiration. So next is you give atropine. So do, before procedure, worsed, atropine may be given. Worsed, you're monitoring respiration. 
and why you're giving Varset an atropine to prevent what? Aspiration, and Varset is to relax the patient. So it's a awake sedation. It's a sedation. Patient is aware what's happening. It says in the next, it says in the first line, conscious sedation. What side do you turn? Here you correct here, turn the patient on the left side. So please correct here. What side are we turning? Yeah. Left side. What medications are we given? Varsin and atropine. Why do we give Varsin to sedate? Why do we give atropine to prevent aspiration? Now I will move on is airway is important during the procedure and check the patient pulse oximetry. You are looking for oxygenation. After procedure, and what do we monitor after? Two things are important. Gag reflex, underline that. And second line, it says perforation. So what do we monitor here? Gag reflex and perforation. I will repeat one more time, then we are done with EGD. There are two words for your questions, EGD and endoscopy. Upper endoscopy means patient is scheduled for EGD. In our question, maybe patient is scheduled for endoscopy, and what would you do before patient is going? So what do we do? And beyond. That's a very important word. Why? To prevent aspiration. What drugs are we going to give here? Versed and atropine. What position do you put your patient? That side. What do we monitor after the procedure are gag reflex and perforation. Now I want to connect with this so we will move on to the next page. And our next page, if you will go on, and it says here. ERCP word. Let's go on ERCP. What is ERCP? It's a long word. What is ERCP? Endoscopy, retrograde, polyangiopancreatography. What is ERCP? E means endoscopy. R means retrograde, polyangiopancreatography. Pancreatography. Anytime we see the word polyangiopancreatography means they're looking for what? Pancreas and gallbladder. So write down there, pancreas and gallbladder, and underline the word hepatobiliary. So write down the word hepatobiliary means is they're looking the side of the liver and the gallbladder and the pancreas. Many question when they give it to us, and they might say, patient has pancreatitis, patient has pancreas cancer, what test are we going to do? So remember what test are you going to be patient schedule? ERCP. Very important, EGD stays till duodenum. When we are moving into ERCP, that's an important test when you are recognizing what is the problem with the patient with pancreas, gallbladder, and on the liver side. So this test is done for what? Hepatobiliary system. Are we okay? EGD, ERCP. Same answers. What do you do when patient is going pre-op is NPO. And post-op, what do you monitor? Same thing, gag reflex and perforation. So what do you do when your patient is scheduled for ERCP? Is you monitor for gag reflex and perforation. What is the meaning perforation? Bleeding. And what are the signs of bleeding for a patient would be? They're going into shock. So you may not be the word is bleeding, may not be the word is perforation, when patient is showing sign and symptom of shock. What are the sign and symptom of shock are? Your blood pressure would be low, and pulse would be high, and respiration would be high. So what is the word is called when the pulse is high? Is tachycardia and tachypenia. So they give the word patient has tachycardia, tachypenia, immediately we know patient is bleeding. And patient is going in what shock? Hypovolemic shock. So everyone is okay, two tests we talked about is endoscopy 
And what are the two kinds of endoscopic I said is EGD and ERCP. What are you looking in EGD is the upper part. What is the upper part is esophagus and stomach and the duodenum. ERCP is done for hepatobiliary system. And what is hepatobiliary means is the pancreas, the liver, and the gallbladder. Most of your question may be patient has pancreatitis or patient has cancer of the pancreas, what tests are we going to schedule your patient would be ERCP. And what is the full word is called endoscopic and retrograde polyangiopancreatography. Everyone is okay, EGD two words are, and ERCP we talked about it. Now I'm going to move on on the top of the page on page number two. Anoscopy. Patient is going for anoscopy. That means they are examining the patient through the anus. And position is important. Is knee chest position right on the top on the same page. On the same page on the top it says knee chest position is important. Positioning are important. We are nurses. We need to know what patient is going to be in what position. Next is proctoscopy and sigmoid scopy. What position do you put on proctoscopy and sigmoid scopy is called left lateral. What is the other name for the left lateral here? Sims position, but not right. Always Sims left lateral. So make sure we can write down the word Sims position. Clonoscopy, patient is scheduled to go for clonoscopy, what do we do before patient is going for clonoscopy? Let's go on pre-op care. We all know it's an invasive procedure. Consent is important, so if you want to add there, consent. But what do you do pre-op care? Is patient must be clean. That means is what anima are we going to give? Cleansing anima. Patient must be clean. Second thing we are giving nowadays are Go lightly. So make sure we write down the word go lightly. Go lightly is the medication. It comes in the powder. We have to mix the water and keep it in the fridge to cool it so patient can drink or person can drink. And they have to drink about a gallon of water with that. So next word, I want you where it says cleansing enema. Everyone should know the word go lightly. G-O-L is Y, T, go lightly. G-O-L-Y-T-L-Y, go lightly. It's a laxative. And when patient is getting before procedure, they got to drink. And how do you know your go lightly is working? Before patient is going, they are clear and they have no VM and at the end their water is coming out. So what do you think you will monitor if they give you a question, patient has taken go lightly. So what does they have? They're losing a lot of fluid. So what do you monitor here? With go lightly, I want you to write down the word electrolytes. What are our electrolytes are? Is your sodium, potassium, remember, very important is the lab and I'm going to give you at the end electrolytes package and we all need to start knowing our electrolytes. It's a GI system. Patient is having vomiting, diarrhea or after go lightly, patient may be dehydrated. I want you to write down after giving go lightly, what do we monitor is dehydration and electrolytes. And abnormal lab in your NCLEX are electrolytes, they may give you the labs. And if you have any abnormal labs, that means sodium or potassium, you need to notify. Everyone is okay? Patient is going for clonoscopy, what are we giving them? Our number one is anima. If not anima, they have go lightly. Go lightly is to clear and clean the patient. And invasive procedure. Now, next thing is, you will remember your patient is NPO after midnight for the test. Post-op care is what do you monitor after the procedure? The complications from clonoscopy can be peritonitis. And why peritonitis? When there is a perforation. 
perforation it can lead to and that means maybe something rupture inside and it's leading perforation and maybe leading to peritonitis. So what are the two complications after the procedures are perforation and peritonitis. Let me repeat here. Patient is going for colonoscopy. What do we remember is number one, make sure a patient is clean, clear. And what do we give before patient is going for colonoscopy? Give them anima or give them golightly. When we are giving golightly, what are we monitoring? Electrolytes and dehydration. What do you monitor after the procedure patient could be is perforation and maybe patient can lead to peritonitis. And position would be same as left lateral for your colonoscopy. You do have in the second line, underline the word left side. And when you are turning your patient left side, the knee drawn up to the chest. That is important in left lateral position. So what position we are putting the patient? Left lateral, same position. And what do we monitor afterwards? Peritonitis and perforation. Everyone is okay about, uh, we said anima and we said go lightly. Go lightly is to clean your patient. And remember, your questions are safety. Patient immediately after going, after the procedure, they cannot drive. They must have someone to take them home. And they're not staying in the hospital for longer time. It's just the procedure. They go home but must not drive. Someone come with them when they're going for a procedure. So we talked about is colonoscopy. When we have the next thing is cholecystography. What is cholecystography is the coli means is gallbladder. Graphy means, whenever we see the word graphy, graphy means they're taking picture. And what are they looking? Underline the word cholecystography. We are looking for what? Gallbladder. And what do we do when we are doing cholecystography? Well, as soon as we see the word cholecystography, Graphy. Graphy means iodine they're going to use. So in your mind, what do you monitor patient here? Number one, allergies. What allergies here for iodine? And what do we look here for gallbladder? Maybe a gallstone we are looking. Any problem in the gallbladder? And patient has to be NPO. And what do you monitor when you're giving iodine any sign of allergies? And what are the sign of allergies are hives and urticaria. And what do you monitor afterwards is patient is, it's normal diet they can take, but maybe they have dysuria because of the diet, painful urination. And so cholecystography, what is the gallbladder? What do we check here? is the allergies with the iodine. So cholecystography, we talked about it. We talked about in, about the procedure, colonoscopy, ERCP, we are done. The next word, the lo next underneath is percutaneous trans, is cholecystography, percutaneous. When they're saying percutaneous, they're injecting the dye and underline the word injection of dye. And what are they looking here are hepatic duct. That means the liver, cystic, gallbladder, and they're looking percutaneous. Percutaneous means again, they're injecting the dye. And what do you monitor patient here is again post-op care, bleeding. Anytime when they're going through the dye and they're injecting, afterwards what are we monitoring are the bleeding. So percutaneous means they're injecting the dye and they're taking the picture. So that is percutaneous cholangiography is done and we said is cholecystography is the gallbladder we are looking for the patient. Now, very important test is in GI system parasynthesis. What is the word is parasynthesis? What is parasynthesis is, what is the fluid? in the stomach right here. But what is the word we use here for parasynthesis? The fluid in peritoneal 
cavity. So where is the fluid in peritoneal cavity? Now we don't we don't use this abdomen, but the terminology word is what is paracentesis, removing the fluid from where? From peritoneal cavity. Which patient are we removing the fluid for paracentesis? The word is called ascites. Everyone remember the word ascites? What is ascites? The fluid. Now I want you to connect which patient are we going to remove the fluid? Which patient has the fluid? This is GI. So let's think about the GI. Which patient would have the fluid is your liver cirrhosis when they have a problem in the liver. So make sure we, got, we need to remember is our patients. How are we treating our patients when they are admitted? So which patients in GI will have a lot of fluid is in liver cirrhosis. And what is the word is called? Ascites. What is the second condition and second disease you will see more fluid is in, what are the other one is? CHF. And what kind of CHF? You will have ascites. There are two kinds of CHF, right side and left side. So which side CHF has the fluid? Right side. Let me repeat here. Parasynthesis is removing the fluid from where? Peritoneal cavity. Which patients are we removing fluid when they have ascites? And which patient has ascites in GI, number one, liver cirrhosis? And in cardiac, when we go, we talk about CHF, and what side of CHF patient has fluid is the right side is the CHF. So now patient has fluid. Patient would be scheduled to be done paracentesis. Not only all the time for ascites, maybe they want to check the fluid and what kind of fluid patient has, maybe a diagnostic purpose or to relieve the symptom. But what do we do as a nurse? Now let's highlight the word. Two things is important, very important we should know. Where is our peritoneum is right here. So when the fluid is here and we are going to remove now remember, what can be hurt here is the bladder. So very important in your question would be here, when patient is scheduled for parasynthesis, what do you tell your patient is? Number one, empty the bladder. So highlight the word voided. Then second thing we'll remember is checking the vital sign. So everyone is okay? Voiding is important, why? Because we can damage the bladder. We can puncture the bladder. And second thing is very important is it says vital sign. What is it important in vital sign? What is important here is the blood pressure. When you remove a lot of fluid, what happens to the patient? Hypovolemic shock. So two things we keep it in mind in a situs because it's in the fluid in the peritoneal cavity. We will ask the patient to empty the bladder. And second thing is check their vital sign. And what is in the vital sign is important are the blood pressure. Why? Because when you remove a lot of fluid, what happened to the patient? They're going into hypovolemic shock. So vital sign is important. Yes, if they say all that apply question, you can also check the abdominal gut. Can we check the abdominal gut? Yes, because we want to know what is the size before procedure and what is the size of the abdomen after the procedure. So everyone is okay, consent is very important. It's a procedure which is patient is going through invasive procedure. We must know two wording. What is invasive means when you're going inside the body. Non-invasive is not affecting internal organs. So it's invasive procedure, consent is important, and what do we tell the patient to avoid? And what are you checking? Highlight the word vital sign. I want you to write down the word blood pressure. What are we monitoring? Yes, you can also monitor abdominal gut, you can monitor the weight. Now position, what position would be good for a patient when we are doing paracentesis? because you want to drain the fluid. The fluid is coming by gravity. So what is the best is patient may be sitting upright. So highlight the word upright position in the first line and sitting at the edge of the bed or maybe on the chair. And second position, highlight the word in the next line, Fowler's position. 
So upright position is good. Patient may be sitting upright or farmer's position. So everyone is okay. What position you're going to remove the fluid is upright or farmer's position. Those two wording. Some patients, they're very weak. They may not be able to sit. If they can sit, we can keep them in the, maybe on the table or on the bed. But what position is important is Fowler's position. Now, what do you monitor during the procedure? Also, I want you to remember, any time during procedure you are removing fluid, keep monitoring blood pressure. That means the vital sign, because all of a sudden, changes in the body fluid is changes in the vital sign. So you keep monitoring the blood pressure during the procedure. After the procedure, what do you monitor? Again, vital sign. And what is important in vital sign is here is the blood pressure. You've got to monitor the patient's blood pressure. Next line, abdominal girth is okay. But second line, hypovolemia. So what are the two complications is here is hypovolemia. So what are we monitoring after the procedure? Hypovolemia means the blood pressure and patient can go hypovolemic shock. Then we will underline the word hematuria. A patient is bleeding. Uh, the, what is the word hematuria? The blood in the urine. So if there is a blood in the urine, that means patient is bleeding. Very important in your question, the last word. If patient coming back after the procedure and they ask you, and after paracynthesis, patient's color of the urine is pink. What do you do? Is pink or red? Pink color is, shouldn't be there. That means there is a damage. So pink or red color of the urine, sign of bleeding. So what do you do, pink or red color? You notify the physician immediately. So let me repeat here. Paracentesis is done, why? To remove the fluid from where? From the peritoneal cavity. And when patient has a lot of ascites, what do we monitor before the procedure is again the blood pressure. Consent is important. And remember one word, empty the bladder. After the patient come back from the procedure, what are we monitoring here? Is the vital sign, the blood pressure, and the color of the urine. If we have a pink color, we need to notify. Monitor the vital sign, monitor for bleeding, and assess your patient. So we have done all these tests, and very important, the next test is liver biopsy. Where do we have liver? We all should know where is our liver is on the right hypochondria or right upper quadrant. Everyone is okay, where is the liver? On the right side. I will clear, upper quadrant. What do we do for your patient when we are doing liver biopsy? Number one is supine position. Yes, you do need the consent is important. Explaining, I'm not going what you already know. Explaining your patients all your procedure. Consent is important, but position. Because it's in the right side upper quadrant, what position you can leave a patient here is underline the word supine. If patient, supine means is what? On the back. If patient cannot lay on supine, then what position are we going to turn? To the left lateral position. You turn them on the left side, keep the right side exposed, upper abdomen, because where is the liver on the right side? Now what would you do post-op care? Post-op care is very important. We are monitoring for bleeding. Now when patient is bleeding, and it can lead to also infection. So second complication can be peritonitis. So what are the two complications here? The bleeding and <laughs> infection and peritonitis. What do we do? Patient returns back immediately after the procedure, bed rest, number one. Number two, what side do you turn your patient now? On the right side. And also they can say put the pillow under the costal region or put the pillow under the right side. Why? Because we are applying what? The pressure. So what did we do up before procedure? Patient is on supine on the back. If they cannot be on the back, 
you can turn them on the left side, expose the right upper area. After the procedure, patient is back, you can turn them, bed rest is important, they cannot walk, give them bed rest and turn them on the right side and put the pillow on where? On the, on the right side under the costal area. What are we applying here? Pressure and preventing from bleeding. The next thing is the last line. Avoid lifting. Avoid exercise, strenuous exercise for one week. Avoid coughing. Avoid straining means constipation. A patient is constipated or they are coughing, what happened? We are increasing abdominal pressure and that can lead to bleeding. So everyone, we must know, even patient is going home right away after the procedure, after a few hours, what would you teach a patient when they're going home? Avoid constipation, avoid lifting, avoid sternus exercise because they can bleed. Everyone is okay where is the uh, liver is? On the right side, upper quadrant. When we are talking about GI, what do we assess a patient in GI is bowel sounds. Are we clear? And what are we assessing if a patient has a GI problem is abdomen. Abdominal assessment, I'm moving on. We have done some tests for all our patients where they can be going for certain tests. But we must know when patient is admitted and they have GI problem, we are going to assess abdomen. And what assessment we do here, check the color of the skin. Check the tenderness is or distinction and assess the bowel sound. And what do we do the bowel sounds is normal bowel sounds you have here, underline the word is five to 30 times a minute or every five to 15 seconds are normal bowel sound. What side do we auscultate in all the quadrant first? What side we auscultate here? is starting from what side you're listening? From the right lower quadrant. Then you move right upper quadrant. Then you move left upper, and then you're going to move left lower quadrant. How long you should listen the bowel sounds? Five minutes in each quadrant. Make sure we highlight the word five minutes in each quadrant. And what do you, how do you hear the bowel sounds and what do you do in assessment? Where it says the bowel sound, first thing is you inspect the abdominal cavity. Second thing, you auscultate. Percussion. What is the last thing you do in abdominal assessment? Palpation. Everyone is okay? What is the last thing we do? Palpation. How long do you hear the bowel sounds? Every five minutes and it's important your assessment and you're looking for GI system. Now any question, patient come back after surgery, a patient is having a problem and patient has been vomiting, before we give our patients food, what are you going to assess the bowel sound? And what is another word is for bowel sound is peristalsis. What is peristalsis? The way our food is passing, a lot of times they may not give you the word bowel sound. So what are we assessing? Peristalsis. What is peristalsis? The way the food is passing in our GI system. So everyone should know auscultation, very important, and what quadrant you're starting from right lower quadrant, and how long do we listen? The bowel sounds are five minutes. Now, I want you to write down one word here, is the word is, you don't have there, is xerostomia. And it has been coming up a lot of questions. And because we are talking X, E, R, O, S, T, then M, I, A. Xerostomia means dry mouth. A lot of patients, when they're going for treatment, they use this word. So I added there. And you guys can add there, xerostomia word is dry mouth. Maybe after chemotherapy, maybe after some drugs patients are taking, and what do they have? Xerostomia word. And that's been keep coming in exam a lot. So we must know the xerostomia word is dry mouth. And what do we can give? There are medication, 
and it's called saliva substitute because you do want to keep their mouth not too dry and give them saliva substitute so they have more saliva and prevent them from dryness of their mouth. So xerostomia word is important for dry mouth and now I'm going to move on on disease GERD. Everyone knows what the word is GERD is gastroesophageal reflexes and we are going on the diseases now so I'm starting with GERD and what is GERD is backflow of gastric and duodenal content into the esophagus so the food is going up and where towards the esophagus and that is called GERD and what is it could be the reason is esophageal sphincter or pyloric stenosis. We all remember when we have learned about the stomach. In the babies also, questions are pyloric. So remember, upper part is cardiac and lower part is the pyloric. Or when we are saying there is a problem, this can be your esophageal sphincter and this is pyloric sphincter. Everyone is okay? So there is a problem is going up here is esophagus. Pyloric is area of the stomach, the lower part. Are we clear? So the upper part is called esophageal of the stomach or cardiac part of the stomach. And what is this one is called pyloric part of the stomach. Everyone is okay? And what happened here? There is a problem in sphincter and the fluid is what happened going upward. So what is GERD is? The stomach content or uh, duodenal content, the food is going upward. And what does the patient feel here? We all know normal word is recalled is heartburn. What, what is the other word for heartburn is pyrosis. What is pyrosis means the heartburn, pyrosis. Pyrosis, very important to learn the new wording because a lot of times they don't give the word heartburn. We all know heartburn. So what is heartburn is called pyrosis. Is dyspepsia. What is dyspepsia word is indigestion. In simple word we know what is word is heartburn and second is indigestion. What is indigestion word is called dyspepsia and pyrosis. And what does it cause indigestion, regurgitation, and underline the word swallowing problem. Sometimes there is a pain and they won't have a problem in swallowing. So what is GERD is we all know burning sensation. But let's know the good wording, pyrosis, and also the word dyspepsia. Dyspepsia means is in digestion. Intervention, we are nurses. What do we do a patient is having a problem with GERD as a teaching question and how will we teach the patient? Number one, diet. What kind of diet do we tell the patient to eat? Underline the word low fat diet because the fat takes longer to digest. So what kind of diet, what are we cutting here? Fat, so that's important. Fiber and avoid caffeine, avoid tobacco, carbonated beverages. Those are in your diet. The fat you avoid, caffeine, tobacco, carbonated beverages. That you will teach the patient. Number two, avoid eating and drinking just before going to the bed. That means eat early and because it takes a longer time to digest food. So if you're eating and just going right away back to the bed, the food is not digested. So number one, is the diet teaching. Number two, eat early. Next is tight clothing to prevent any discomfort. So that also is good. And <clears throat> very important is raise the head of the bed. Are we clear? So what do we do? Raise the head of the bed to prevent GERD. And maybe they can use using the blocks, six to eight inches block and raising the head of the bed. So using a block, they can throw in that question, that's okay, because you're putting extra block under the bed and raising the head of the bed. And raise the head of the bed. So everyone is okay, girl, is diet, what diet we cut down here? The fat, any carbonated beverages are not good, tobacco is not good, caffeine is not good. 
Now, avoid anticholinergic medication. Why do we avoid anticholinergic medication? Because it delays emptying the stomach. So the food will stay more longer. So that may be on your question. Now, what would be the treatment, surgical treatment would be done if they did not help them with the medication or by treating them by diet is the surgery is called fundo application. What is the name of the surgery? Fundo application. What is fundo application means is F-U-N-D-O-P-L-I-C-A-T-I-O-N. Fundo application is surgery is done. What do they do in surgery? Wrapping the part of the gastric fundus. So what they're doing, they're pulling up the muscles and making it what is wrapping around. So it's a surgery, they're wrapping around the stomach and preventing from birth symptom. So what is the name of the surgery is called fundo application. Now second disease, I'm going to go on, hiatal hernia. When they're saying hiatal hernia, very important, the other name we must know is called diaphragmatic hernia. So what is to work here? Hiatal hernia, diaphragmatic hernia. Some question they may not give the, uh, is uh, hiatal, and they may give the word is diaphragmatic. So where is the diaphragm we have? We have a diaphragm muscles right here. And what is diaphragm is separating our GI, this is our lungs here, and GI system. So what happened when we are saying hernia? Hernia word is protrusion. So what happened? The stomach is pushing upward in thoracic cavity. So everyone should know two words, hiatal hernia, and what is the other word is called? Diaphragmatic hernia. Very important wording. What is diaphragmatic hernia? Underline stomach herniated through the diaphragm. So where is the stomach herniating? Through the diaphragm. And so where is the stomach is going? Upward in the chest cavity, more up here. So underline, what is hiatal hernia? The stomach is herniated where? In the thoracic cavity. This is our thoracic chest cavity is thoracic cavity. This is abdominal cavity. Our GI system is here in the abdomen, but the stomach has been pushed up in where? In thoracic cavity. So what do we monitor patient here is underline the word why is second line. Why does it happen? Underline the word weakening of the muscles. What happened to the patient? Weakening of the muscles uh, of the diaphragm. So diaphragm muscles are weak. And which patient you will see more? Maybe during pregnancy, obesity, if they have tumor, if they have ascites. So that means ascites, pregnancy, and diaphragm is loose muscles here, and they're pushing the stomach upward. So what is it called? Hiatal hernia and diaphragmatic hernia. Now what are the signs and symptoms? Almost same is heartburn, but they also have problem dysphagia. What is the word dysphagia? Swallowing problem. And what is the word is here? Regurgitation. The food is coming back. So they are regurgitating. They have dysphagia problem. Same almost like GERD, but they have more problem here is dysphagia too. Complications can lead to bleeding, ulcers. And what do you teach patient here? A small, frequent meal. Always is good. Anytime patients are sick, you don't want to give them too much of food. What do you want to give them are small, frequent meal. Is always good in your answer. Next is, what do we limit here? Fluids, when patient is eating food. Not to recline for one hour after eating food. That means don't go back and don't lay down. Write down the word, elevate the head of the bed. So what do we do? Is GERD, same as in GERD, and hiatal hernia. Two disease, we must keep it in mind in GI, 
you are only elevating the head of the bed. So what are we elevating here? Head of the bed. Everyone is okay, good? And hiatal hernia, and if they give you the word diaphragmatic hernia, is elevating the head of the bed. I will move on uh, about gastritis word. What is the gastric word means is the stomach. What is the gastric means is the stomach. What do we have in our stomach? Number one. So when I'm saying here gastritis word, that means the patient has a problem in the stomach. What do we have in our stomach? First thing we all should know, what do we have in our stomach? We, what, is, what do we have in our stomach? Anybody remember what do we have in the stomach? Yes, somebody said hydrochloric acid. And what is that is called? HCL, hydrochloric acids. And what is the second thing we have in the stomach? We all should know when we are talking about GI. What is the second thing is in the stomach is intrinsic factor. Intrinsic factor. What is intrinsic factor does? What is intrinsic factor does? Absorption of B12. So what is happening in the stomach? We are absorbing what is B12. And what would be the problem? Any question? See how we got to relate the questions are? Patient has gastritis. Patient has chronic gastritis. What are you going to monitor? We all know nausea, vomiting, upset stomach, that's good. We all can figure it out, those answers. But what is it important?